and uh, we will now take the second panel. Mr. Clay. Yeah, he wants to introduce him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, let me swear to him. It is the uh, policy of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses. May I ask you all to rise and raise your right hand? Or do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record show that each has answered in the affirmative. Uh, we will begin the uh, testimony of the second panel, but before we do that, I'd like to invite uh, my friend and colleague from Mass Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, to make an opening statement. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate your good work on this, uh, this matter. It's uh, uh, no secret that uh, the whole uh, organ donation um, profession and, and effort has benefited my family. My brother-in-law is a, a live liver uh, uh, donor recipient, and uh, he's doing quite well after uh, a very serious operation uh, back six years ago. He's doing great. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't know uh, that he went through that, uh, raising uh, you know, three young children and with my sister, and he's doing fine. Uh, but I, I am aware of the pressures and anxieties that affect families who are in this position. Uh, I, I have become very familiar with the whole process and the waiting list and, and the, uh, the pain and suffering that a lot of families go through who, who have uh, family members who, who do not uh, get a, a, a transplant in time and uh, those who are currently waiting. So I think that uh, there is a gap between uh, what legislatively we can do to help and what science allows us to do. I believe that there's, uh, there's an education process that needs to go forward in this country. Uh, I think we have to redouble our efforts to, to help those families that are uh, uh, in, need of, uh, in need of transplants. I think that uh, we can do much to expedite this, this process uh, through our, our laws and, and regulations. And I think that uh, uh, the American people uh, deserve better than what we're giving them right now, given the, the miracles of science that are allowing uh, these uh, uh, donations to occur. The, the technology, the, uh, the medicines, the... Uh, anti-rejection uh, medicines that are now available that make this all possible are, are going forward in, in leaps and bounds. And I don't think that our legislation and our, uh, our regulatory framework allows us to reap the fullest benefit of the wonderful science that's being done in this country and, and around the world. Uh, I, I'm well aware that, uh, you know, some of the, some of the, greatest gains in the early years of uh, live organ donation uh, came from overseas. And so we can, we can benefit those that we, from those efforts and we can help them along as well. But uh, the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, I'm just very happy that, uh, that you're focusing on this. I know there are uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of families that uh, wish for your success in, in, uh, in marshalling our, our efforts in this, this regard and uh, strengthening our organ donor program. With that, I yield back. Thank you so much, Ms. Mr. Lynch. Let me also say I'm thankful for you uh, coming forward today and being a part of this hearing, as well as the, the, the other two members who are not members of this committee but came forward because of their keen interest in this issue of organ and tissue donation. I appreciate you being here Thank you, Mr. today. Chairman. And, and um, on our second panel, uh, we have a distinguished group of individuals who are highly qualified 
to address issues associated with organ donation from a uh, variety of important perspectives. And also included on this second panel is a witness that was supposed to be part of the first panel, but let me welcome uh, Miss Elizabeth Rubin. And thank you for being here. I understand you had a little difficulty, but we're glad you made it anyway. She is a former president and current board member of the Transplant Recipients International Organization known as TRIO. Uh, Ms. Rubin was diagnosed with liver disease nearly 15 years ago following the birth of her second child, but was fortunate enough to receive a liver transplant plant at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center soon after. Since then, Ms. Rubin has dedicated her time and energy to volunteering for several nonprofits involving her two passions, uh, music and organ donor awareness. What a mixture. Uh, through her work with TRIO, she has become a highly distinguished public representative in the areas of donor awareness, education, support, and advocacy. In addition to TRIO, she also serves on the Speakers Bureau of her local uh, organ procurement organization and serves as president of a community music school in Media, Pennsylvania. Ms. Rubin resides in the greater Philadelphia area with her husband, Bruce, and their two daughters. Isabel and Beatrice, thank you for being here. Uh, and also we have Dr. James Burdick, uh, who serves as director of the, the Division of Transplantation at the Health Resources and Services Administration of HHS. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Burdick was a professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, as well as a past president of the United Network for Organ Sharing. Who knows? Uh, doctor, and thank you for being here, Doctor. We also have Dr. Timothy L. Pruitt, uh, who is Director of Transplantation at the University of Virginia Health Systems in Charlottesville and also serves as President of the, uh, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network uh, and the uh, United Network for Organ Sharing uh, Board of Directors. He previously chaired the Open UNOS Membership and Professional Standards Com Committee as well as its Policy Compliance Subcommittee and also served on its Ethics and Pediatric Transplantation Committees. We appreciate your time here today. Uh, Ms. Ms. Sue Dunn is the President-Elect of the Association of Organ Procurement Organizations as well as President and CEO of Donor Alliance a federally designated organ procurement organization based in Denver, Colorado. Ms. Dunn serves on a variety of United Network for Organ Sharing Committees and continues to represent the donation community through her participation with the Association of Organ Procurement Organization and the Donor Awareness Council. We're so glad to see you today. Uh, Dr. Clive O. Callender is the founder of the National Minority Organ Tissue Plants Transplant Education Pro Program, otherwise known as MOTEP, which is dedicated to increasing minority donation rates nationally. MOTEP is the first national organization to identify a two-fold solution uh, to the number one problem in transplantation, the shortage of donors. Uh, the, so the solution includes decreasing the number of persons being added to the national waiting list through a health promotion disease prevention campaign while simultaneously increasing the number of minority donors. Dr. Callender serves as the chairman of the, of the Department of Surgery at the Howard University Hospital and as a professor at the Howard University College of Medicine. He is a graduate of both Hunter College and Meharry Medical College, and welcome, Doctor. I'm so glad to get the opportunity to meet you. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Crippen is the Medical Director of the Liver Transplant Program at Barnes Jewish Hospital uh, and a Professor of Medicine at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, which uh, both facilities I represent proudly. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and the University of Kansas School of Medicine and is the immediate past president of the American Society of Transplantation. And I want to welcome you all 
to today's hearing. And uh, I'll just uh, ask each, with each witness to be aware that you'll have a five minute clock. Uh, would you please try to observe it in your opening statements? Uh, and we'll start here with Dr. Burdick. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Clay, uh, Mr. Lynch. Um, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today on behalf of the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, to discuss the roles and responsibilities of the Division of Transplantation in strengthening our nation's organ donor programs and awareness activities. I appreciate your continuing support of the organ donation and transplantation programs and your organization of this very heartwarming and uh, wonderful uh, uh, hearing. The need for organ transplants continues to grow and this demand continues to outpace the supply of transplantable organs. 19 people in this country will die every day because a life-saving organ does not become available to them. During the past decade, the number of deceased donors increased between two to 3% annually while the annual growth rate in the number of individuals waiting for an organ transplant increased by approximately 8%. Even with the recent unprecedented 10.8% increase in the number of deceased donors in 2004, followed by a 6.2% increase in 2005 related to the donation breakthrough collaboratives, there still were about 97,000 individuals waiting for an organ transplant at the end of 2006, as you recognized, Chairman Clay, in your initial remarks. HRSA is responsible for administering a number of organ donation and transplantation programs. The National Organ Transplant Act, or NOTA, PL 98507, as amended, authorized the creation and operation of the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, the operation of the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, and grants and contracts to conduct projects designed to increase the number of organ donations. Additional program authorities were provided by the Organ Donation and Recovery Improvement Act, uh, ODRIA for short, um, some called the Frist Bill, PL 108-216, which amended NOTA to help increase the number of organ donors and number of organs made available for transplantation. The key additional authorities under these, uh, under ODRIA include grants to states to support organ donation awareness, grants and contracts to support public education and outreach activities designed to increase the number of organ donors, including living donors, grants to qualified organ procurement organizations and hospitals to establish programs to increase the rate of organ donation, the expansion of grant making authority to inc include public institutions, the development and dissemination of educational materials to inform healthcare professionals and other appropriate professionals about organ, tissue, and eye donation, financial assistance to living donors to help defray travel and other incidental non-medical expenses, and mechanisms to evaluate the long-term effects of living organ donation. In 2006, a total of 28,923 organ transplant operations were performed nationwide, and that was up from 28,112 the year before, a little under 2,000 more. And from these operations in the year 2006, 31,184 organs were transplanted. Of that number, about 78% were deceased donors, 22% living donors. At HRSA, one of the ways we are keeping donation efforts on a fast track is through our highly successful Organ Donation Breakthrough Collaborative. The collaborative brings together donation professionals and hospital leaders to identify and share best practices to maximize organ donation in their facilities. The goal is to raise the uh, number to 75% of eligible donors actually becoming donors. The results are most impressive. Since 2003, the number of hospitals that have achieved the 75% goal has increased from 55 to 301. The national average of donation has risen by 10% across the board, and we have over 20% more actual transplants. This year, HHS joined with private companies and organizations across America in encouraging their employees to give five, save lives. The Give Five, Save Lives Challenge asked employees to support donation by taking five minutes out of their workday to enroll in a state organ donor registry or sign a donor card. In February, HRSA announced the results of a 2005 Gallup organization survey, which indicates that Americans continue to strongly support the donation of organs and tissues for transplantation. More important, the survey also found that 52% of Americans have taken personal actions to become organ donors, up from about 28% in a similar survey done in 1993. Despite these advances, 
HRSA is humbled by the fact that people are still dying because of the lack of available organs. <clears throat> In our vigilance, HRSA sustains support for other donation programs. The OPTN, which HRSA manages, continues to improve the efficiency of the organ transplantation system by improving organ allocation policies and monitoring policy compliance by transplant programs and OPOs. Grants were awarded to OPOs and hospitals to establish programs coordinating organ donation activities. In our outreach efforts, HRSA maintains support for public and professional education programs. Working together, we are making great strides, but we still have a long way to go. We recently celebrated 50 years since the first successful organ transplant, which was done in Massachusetts, and we have come a long way. However, while nearly 29,000 individuals received life-saving transplants in 2006, the need to increase the number of successful transplants remains critical. There are close to 97,000 patients on the national waiting list, and 19 will die every day because a life-saving organ does not become available to them. Working together, we can change these numbers. HRSA is proud of its leadership role in this most worthwhile effort, and there are clear signs we are moving in the right direction, but we must do everything we can to keep the momentum going. So finally, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here today on behalf of all of those waiting for a transplant to discuss the organ donation and transplantation and for your dedication and interest to these vital programs. And eventually I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lynch, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. I would also like to applaud the uh, Congressional Organ Donor and Tissue Caucus for what it has done and what it will do in the future. And I also would like to applaud you for the Everson Walls and Ron Springs Organ Donation Support Act of 2007. It speaks legions to what we can pro do for our, uh, our citizens. My name is Timothy Pruitt. I'm the Strickler Family Professor of Transplantation and Surgery at the University of Virginia and the current president of the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network and the United Network for Organ Sharing. For all that mouthful, the UNOS is a uh, nonprofit organization which operates the OPTN contract with HRSA, but it's not my intent today to speak as an official representative of the transplant community. Rather, I would rather would like to speak for the patients and families that I've seen as an individual providing transplant care for the past 20 years. For the most part, people of all ages with end-stage kidney, liver, heart, and lung problems will live longer and better with an organ transplant than with other forms of medical support. Unfortunately, the numbers of people waiting for the organs greatly outstrips organ availability from deceased individuals. And because of an increased waiting time and a continuing gap between the numbers of people waiting and organs available, a number of Americans, like Mr. Walls earlier uh, described today, step forward every year to donate an organ to another person. And although many or types of organs can be transplanted with live organs, <clears throat> this amazing act of generosity is most frequent with those that need and receive kidney transplants. And from a systems perspective, a kidney is from a live donor is best. It lasts longer in the recipient. It's, easier, it's an easier operation to plan for the recipient and the medical center. It functions more quickly and reliably than one from a deceased donor. In short, if you needed a kidney, you would want to receive one from someone that is alive and not dead. The first kidney transplant was performed came from a live donor, as Dr. Burdick said. In 2006, over 30% of the kidneys transplanted in the U.S. came from live organ donors. It's a form of organ donation that our people have embraced for more than 50 years. The executive and legislative branches of the government have recently weighed in regarding the value of live organ donation. Because there are so many instances where Americans are willing to donate but biology gets in the way, a variety of paired donation uh, uh, have been proposed to increase in uh, this type of donation. Congress has recently addressed the issue through legislation, is on the verge of passing uh, H.R. 710, the bill named for former Representative Charlie Norwood. That bill officially provides what the Department of Justice has recently approved in memo form that paired donation between live donors and recipients does not constitute valuable consideration is therefore legal under Section 301 of NOTA. In 2006, a directive was uh, published in the Federal Register instructing the OPDN to develop policies regarding living organ donors, living organ recipients, including policies for equitable allocation of living donor organs in accordance with Section 121.8 of the final rule. It is clear that the value of living organ donation and transplantation is an activity to be encouraged from the perspective of those who need to receive organs, the medical community, those that reimburse organ transplantation, and the government and oversight community. 
The live donor does an extraordinary act, lying down on an operating room table, giving a piece of himself or herself for another person, placing one's health and safety in the hands of doctors and nurses when there's no direct medical benefit for that person. Our society and treasury gets a great deal of benefit from this form of generosity. Unfortunately, the pain of recovery from the procedure of removing a kidney or any other organ is often not the only kind of pain that the donor suffers. Financial pain is also very common. Sif significant financial disincentive to be an organ donor exists in the United States. This comes in many forms, lost wages of the donor and the family support members, temporary change in the ability to perform one's job during the recovery period, travel costs incurred during the evaluation to be a donor, potential ability to obtain and collect insurance benefits as a consequence of the donation process. This parenthetically, Mr. Walls asked me to speak on this because he had difficulty obtaining health or life insurance after he was a donor uh, for several months prior to convincing them that he would be able to uh, live a long life. We have no safety net for those who want to donate organs. Unfortunately, the kidney donation is relatively safe with a very low risk of death or minimal long-term morbidity, but there are multiple reports in the transplant and lay literature and even more personal anecdotes of significant financial hardship associated with the live organ process which have been communicated to us. This is particularly true for those individuals with personal incomes at the lower end of our financial earnings spectrum. Although the costs of the medical workup are covered by the recipient's payer for the person without means, the personal savings, family or employee's ability to help defray the additional expenses just do not exist. As a society, we gain much in the quality of life from recipients and financial benefits of the acts of generosity that occur daily through organ donation. I recently gave a talk uh, entitled The Ethical Aspects of Live Organ Donation, and during the discussion at this international meeting, there was unanimous agreement that live organ donation was not cost neutral for any donor in any country. Not only did the donation cost to the organ, or part thereof, the part thereof, but it usually costs sums of monies in lost wages and out-of-pocket expenses. In this, inter in this forum, the international community felt that we should be able to do better. In fact, if we can create a model that minimizes the personal cost to the live organ donor and its family, we are likely to see more donors from people at the lower end of the financial spectrum step forward to donate for the benefit of their loved ones. An important point of the goal in the projected uh, is that the projected cost of making organ donation cost neutral would not be more than the savings to the system as it costs more to keep someone on dialysis, th dialysis than to transplant them. <coughs> the major areas to be addressed should include health insurance, automatic Medicare eligibility or some such variant in the event that the organ donor develops a medical condition requiring treatment, short-term disability and life insurance for those people who either are able to un unable to return to work or have significant catastrophic events. Reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses and a variety of methods are available to accomplish this means. Doctor, yes, may, sir. I, may I ask you to summarize, please? Yes, the financial benefits of our society are real and we need to continue to develop new methods and systems that increase the numbers of organs from deceased donors. Simply to look at the live organ donation system, we penalize the patient who wants to donate an organ. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me now recognize Ms. Dunn. Uh, you may proceed with your testimony. Please. Thank you, Chairman Clay, Mr. Lynch. My name is Sue Dunn, and I'm president-elect of the Association of Organ Procurement Organizations, otherwise known as AOPO. I'm also president and CEO of Donor Alliance, the nonprofit, federally designated organ procurement organization, or OPO, that serves Colorado and most of Wyoming. It's my privilege to offer you my perspective today as a donation professional, one of thousands across the country who honor the decisions of deceased individuals and families to save lives as organ and tissue donors. OPOs are responsible for the identification and care of organ donors and their families, organ recovery and preservation, transportation, and data collection regarding deceased organ donors. OPO staff work with donor families and educate medical staff and the general public about organ donation. The priority of OPOs has always been to respect donors' wishes and to provide support to donor families during the most difficult time of their lives. Since starting my career as a donor coordinator over 23 years ago, I've been continually inspired by the capacity of individuals and families to give the gift of life. 
Thanks to these organ donors and the partnership of federal and state government, OPOs, the nation's largest hospitals and transplant programs, Colorado, Wyoming, and the rest of the nation have seen unprecedented gains in saving lives through transplantation. In the donation service area that I'm responsible for of Colorado and Wyoming, the number of deceased organ donors increased by 40% from 2003 to 2006, and this also marked with a 25% increase nationwide. Given that only 1% of all hospital deaths occur under circumstances that medically allow for organ donation, every single donation opportunity is crucial. Several factors have helped Colorado, Wyoming, and the rest of the nation convert more opportunities into gifts of life than ever before. First, we made the responsibility for every organ donation opportunity a shared one with government, donor hospitals, OPOs, transplant centers, medical examiners, and all others equally being accountable for success. In Colorado and Wyoming, hospitals took ownership of their critical role by, in the process by working collaboratively with us and adopting nationally recognized best practices. Secondly, our focus on data-driven performance measures has helped all parties involved focus on every donor and every organ every single time. When the organ donation and transplantation breakthrough collaborative set goals of 75% conversion rate and a 3.75 organs transplanted per donor, I have to say we were all in disbelief. The bar was set very high, but no more. I want to share with you our experience at Donor Alliance. Over the past two years, our conversion rates have consistently been at 80%. That means eight out of every 10 eligible donors' organs are transplanted. Many factors have contributed to this success, an early referral system, trained family support coordinators, an effective donor registry, an organizational focus of placing all organs in active local transplant programs. The organs transplanted per donor metric has proven a bit more of a challenge. In certain demographic groups, we are placing 4.0 organs per donor. However, our overall average is only 3.3. The demographic mix, the nature of injuries and the overall health of the donor does impact organ placement. Rigorous post-donor reviews are conducted with our staff and our medical director to see how we can improve those practices after every case. And thirdly, OPOs have benefited from the active involvement of hospital leadership. By developing relationships with senior, lead excuse me, senior leadership at large donor hospitals, hospital systems, and the state hospital associations, Donation becomes an institution-wide effort, not simply the responsibility of critical care nurses or physicians. Most hospitals now include some sort of measure of donation on their organizational dashboards that are circulated to the executive team as well as their boards of directors. With this momentum and extraordinary results, the OPO community has worked to sustain and expand the efforts of the Joint Commission Accreditation Standards implementing the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services conditions of participation for OPOs, spreading the collaborative, and championing the revised Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. The UAGA, which as of September 21st, had been adopted by 20 states and had legislation pending in at least others. The UAGA represents a significant, far-reaching effect, and it's important to note that it only relates to deceased donors. In general, the UAGA incorporates a number of important features. Most importantly for this discussion today is the creation of state donor registries, which allow individuals to enroll in state-authorized computer donor registries. Most of these are managed under the Department of, Health, of Motor Vehicles. Donor registries have several key benefits. First, by recording one's wishes in a searchable database, it makes sure that the donor's wish is honored. Secondly, we also know that obtaining consent at the very front end of the case allows us to move to organ placement in a much quicker fashion. In Colorado and Wyoming, along with other parts of the United States, more than 40% of our organ donors are off of the registry and 50% of our tissue donors. To sum up, Colorado and Wyoming and the rest of the nation have benefited from the concerted efforts of the past several years. As you know, an increase in donor organs not only save lives, but also saves the federal government millions of dollars in dialysis and other health care costs. Thank you for helping us sustain and build our mission to honor donors' wishes, support donor families, and save lives. Thank you so much, Ms. Dunn, for your testimony. Now we'll go to Dr. Callender. Please proceed. 
I'm Dr. Clive Callan, the transplant surgeon at Howard University Hospital and the founder and principal <coughs> investigator of MOTAP. MOTAP is addressing the number one problem in transplantation today, the shortage of donors, the shortage of organ donors. Because of this shortage, nearly 20 people die every day and taxpayers spend $40,000 per patient per year for kidney dialysis treatments. The MOTEP program provides organs which saves lives and over time decreases health care expenditures on dialysis by $235 million for kidneys alone. Since 1982, 25 years ago, we've participated in the growth and development of a national donor education program which relies on a grassroots strategy that emphasizes community education and empowerment requiring the community to be an efficient and economically appropriate change agent. The methodology we use provides compelling evidence of the efficiency of a community-based grassroots approach, delivering a two-pronged message aimed at increasing donation rates and promoting the adoption of healthy lifestyle behaviors and practices. The key for its success is utilizing a methodology that emphasizes the use of culturally sensitive and ethnically similar community individuals who are transplant recipients, donors, and their family members as messengers. When we started this effort in the African American community in 1982, it was stated to me that blacks don't and won't donate organs. Ten years later, our success in the African American community resulted in the conceptualization of MOTAP and expanded our effort into all minority populations. Ten years after this, as Table 1 demonstrates, minorities now donate in proportion to their population distribution. When we look at uh, our second table, the Scientific Transplant Registry has data that demonstrates that when MOTEP sites are involved, and when compared and contrasted with non-MOTEP sites, we have significantly improved donation rates when compared to regions in which there were no MOTEP sites. Our final table shows that the number of donors, the organ donors per million, and donation percentages have statistically increased in all minority groups. And in fact, while minorities represent 25% of the American population, the number of minority donation percentages has increased over that 10-year period from 15% to 30%. Since 50% of all kidney transplants range, survival ranges from 5.3 to 12.2 years, and most more than nine years, it is clear that the financial bef benefit to the government supporting a national donor education program such as we talk about would save millions of dollars. And we look and we break it down since dialysis costs are in excess of $40,000 per patient per year, much of which are packed taxpayers' dollars, and transplants break even after three years, this would provide an average saving of at least $30,000 per year for each year the organ survives over three years. Assuming an organ, organ survival rate of six years, each donor organ would save at least $135,000 per donor. Assuming our, our, our uh, kidney transplants cost after three years would be $10,000. Looking at the graphics that we just talked about, it is clear that the cost-benefit ratio is one that is a worthy investment uh, when we consider the benefits greatly outweigh the underfunded support it, that's provided to national donor education programs. Now, these data are based upon the current census that identifies 25% of the American population as minorities. The MOTEP goal is by 2010 to have 35% of the donors being minorities and to have African Americans and Latinos to increase from 41 organ donors per million to 50 organ donors per million. Should this occur, we would recover 1,750 minority donor organs and save the government $236 million. While MOTEP has received a total of $16 million from the federal government between 1992 and now, none of these dollars have been allocated for organ donation after 2007. This would mean this unique program, which has made a national contribution to the donor shortage, would cease to exist after mid-year 2008. 
Currently, MOTEF exists in 11 sites, only five of which are partially funded. To op optimize this unique community grassroots education program, funding for 15 to 25 sites would require three to five million dollars a year for an additional five years. A small amount when compared to the $236 million saved from kidney transplants alone and the more than $1 billion saved when kidneys, liver, hearts, and other organs are combined. Thank you so much for that testimony, Doctor. And now we'll go to Dr. Crippen. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Clay, Mr. Lynch. On behalf of the American Society of Transplantation, representing the majority of our nation's professionals engaged in solid organ transplantation, we applaud your leadership for convening this forum today to focus on organ donation and our nation's ability to deliver the gift of life to the thousands of patients currently awaiting a life-saving donor organ. Again, my name is Dr. Jeff Crippen, and I am the immediate past president of the American Society of Transplantation and the medical director of the liver transplant program at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. I'd like to focus very briefly on the efforts of our society on a national level, as well as two efforts uh, that we focus on back home in St. Louis. The American Society of Transplantation knows the education and awareness of patients and physicians alike is crucial to the delivery of effective health care. The Society has developed several educational programs to provide updated information on issues regarding organ failure and its complications, the transplant evaluation, and the transplant procedure itself. We have also crafted a program devoted to the care and maintenance of the transplant after it has occurred. Through these efforts, the AST strives to minimize and eliminate any questions or confusion that may arise as a patient is considering this life-saving surgery before and after the transplant. In our own institution in Missouri at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine, Dr. Amy Waterman, a social psychologist and assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Medical Sciences, is conducting groundbreaking work examining increased patient awareness regarding kidney transplantation. Dr. Waterman is currently developing living kidney donation materials focusing on racial differences in attitudes about diabetes and organ donations. Part of her work is actually funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration through a grant looking at educating patients at kidney dialysis centers about the availability of kidney transplantation. The data obtained by Dr. Waterman and her colleagues will hopefully lay the groundwork for similar programs across America as we continue to fight the battle against misinformation and the lack of information regarding this life-saving therapy. In an effort to reach patients in areas that remain underserved in our state, and not areas not necessarily knowledgeable about transplantation, I've spent the last four and a half years conducting a patient outreach clinic in rural areas, uh, particularly in southeast Missouri. The city of Cape Girardeau is a town of approximately 35,000, as you know, about 120 miles southeast of the St. Louis area. As I have found, for various reasons, many of the town's citizens do not like to leave or travel to large urban settings and often refuse a referral to the big city in spite of a defined need. My presence has allowed these patients and their physicians to see the need for solid organ transplantation and simplified their need. Finally, in 1999, the American Society of Transplantation and other transplant organizations worked closely with Congress to pass and enact legislation providing up to six weeks of paid leave for federal employees seeking to donate a life-saving donor organ. Congressman Elijah Cummings of Maryland spearheaded this initiative in the House of Representatives. In addition to these federal laws, the American Society of Transplantation has initiated its own private campaign entitled the AST Employee Leave and Donation Program. The purpose of this campaign is for our transplant physician members to reach out to corporate America and encourage them to amend their employee leave policies to allow adequate time for employees to serve as a living donor. This has resulted in many companies changing their rules and removing a financial disincentive to donation. Mr. Chairman, 
and members of the subcommittee, the American Society of Transplantation thanks you for the opportunity to participate in today's forum. We applaud and commend your leadership and efforts on this important issue. Of note, the American Society of Transplantation endorsed H.R. 3635 last evening. We look forward to your efforts in getting the bill passed. The gift of life, though often surrounded by tragic circumstances, can prolong the lives of affected Americans, allowing them to maintain their roles as active and productive citizens of our great nation. Thank you. I thank you very much, Dr. Crippen, and thank you for the endorsement of the legislation. Uh, Ms. Rubin, you will uh, be the final witness of this panel, and then we'll get to the question, period. Please proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Elizabeth Rubin, and I am here to represent transplant recipients and patient advocacy groups. As Chairman Clay already reported, I um, had a liver transplant 15 years ago. At the time, I had a very young family, a four-year-old daughter, and a newborn. I took my good health for granted, and when I suddenly learned that my liver was not functioning properly, I did not take it seriously. I chose to ignore the symptoms of lethargy and nausea to continue with my daily activities. After my gastroenterologist had done all the testing he could, coming up with no clear diagnosis, the test for hepatitis and other known liver diseases came back negative. He called my husband and told him, you need to get her to a hospital that can handle this, like the University of Pittsburgh, immediately. So we did, complete with little children in tow, much to the chagrin of my in-laws, and within five days, I was listed for a liver transplant, entering into that cavern of the unknown, because in those days, there wasn't much published information on what to expect while waiting for or going through a transplant. This was the picture that sold my story, the one the doctors used to argue net life benefit to get me on the transplant waiting list. I spent close to five months in Pittsburgh, four of them in and out of the hospital, under the watchful eyes of Dr. Starzl and his protege, John Fung, and spent the remainder of the time trying to get my body to accept the foreign organ. The diagnosis that I was finally given for my liver failure was cryptogenic cirrhosis, which had no cause and therefore should not repeat itself in my system. There were some complications along the way, and it was not until my fourth year post-transplant that things started to level off and I could finally return to my life my new normal life. Talk about a lesson in mortality. The increase in the number of patients on the transplant waiting list is both a positive and negative sign of what has occurred in the transplant world. Positive because improvements in medical technology have made it possible for more patients to be listed for transplant, but negative because the number of donors has not increased at the same pace as the number of candidates. It is imperative that we come up with recommendations on how to increase the number of donors to regulate this country's organ and tissue donor system so that no transplant candidate will be turned away, forced to die rather than to celebrate a second chance at life, as I have been so fortunate to be able to do. In preparing my testimony for today, I consulted with several of my transplant friends to get their input. As a member of the board of TRIO, serving in many positions, including president of the board, as well as a transplant recipient myself, I feel as though I represent the heart of the transplant community. TRIO's mission is to improve the quality of lives touched by the miracle of transplantation through support, advocacy, education, and awareness. As a nonprofit international organization, TRIO has been in existence for over 20 years. Many of our members are transplant recipients. We are proof that transplantation works. You can read more about what TRIO has done to um, improve the awareness of the need for donors in my full testimony. The efforts of TRIO members and other patient advocacy groups over the past decade have improved the rate of donation, but not enough. There are five areas in which I recommend we concentrate our efforts in tackling the donor shortage. 
First of all, for anatomical donors, we should continue to expand the criteria for viable donation. Research should be continued to determine what other categories of potential donors may be acceptable. This may include the use of extended donors and cardiac death patients. I would also suggest that we support and promote stem cell research. Secondly, we need to push for a standardization of state registries in all states of this country. It has already been proven that the number of donors has increased in states where registries exist, but not all states have passed laws in favor of donor registries. Perhaps in addition to driver's license centers, people should be given the option to sign up online as well. Nationwide practice of this and a national database would allow OPOs throughout the country to access the donor list no matter where a potential donor was at the time he was declared brain dead. In addition, regulations need to be standardized and regulated across the United States with regard to the integration of organ donation responsibilities among hospital staff, OPOs, and state registries. The Organ Donation Breakthrough Collaborative has already proven that, that, that this will increase the percentage of organ donors, but this collaborative needs to be extended to all hospitals, OPOs, and state registries in the U.S. Another recommendation is that we seriously examine the possibility of presumed consent as a law of the land. If an examination of the data available from countries using this approach indicates that this could be feasible in the U.S., we could then enlist technology to allow for online opting out or allow people to go to state registry locations to physically opt out. If presumed consent is not deemed feasible, then we should dedicate some time and resources to finding acceptable methods of offering incentives to people who are considering signing up to be organ donors. My final recommendation for deceased donors at this time is that more effort and funding be put into educating the public on the need and reasonableness of organ donation. Or organizations such as TRIO that are successful at doing this should be awarded grants to continue and expand their programs. Two areas where I can see expansion of donor awareness education are driver's education courses and websites on the internet. Websites are an example, an excellent example of technology's use to provide public access to a wealth of information and reports for patients and the general public. For living donors, I also have a few recommendations. I, among the new programs aimed at increasing the use of living donors has been the establishment as previously stated by some OPTN members of directed donation programs. List and pair programs should be universally accepted at all transplant centers. Regulations need to be established and followed, thus removing the question of preferential treatment. Another suggestion for living donors is to offer each and every one of them health and life insurance policies and long-term care and follow-up post-donation. Even though transplant surgery has become less risky, living organ donation still requires one to go through unnecessary surgery, which may cause problems during or after surgery. I have one more recommendation, which although it may not directly impact the number of donors, does impact the longevity of the lives of transplant recipients. It is crucial that we push through the bill promoting lifetime immunosuppressive coverage that has been sitting in Congress for years. Absolutely. It is economically short-sighted to be pushing for improvements in the U.S. organ donor program if we do not concern ourselves with the fact that transplant recipients who cannot afford to pay for their transplant medications once their coverage runs out are dying. If they don't die, they may be fortunate to receive a second transplant, which is just stupid when there is already such a shortage of organs. In closing, I would like to thank this committee once again for holding this hearing to discuss the potential opportunities for strengthening and improving our nation's organ donor programs. I am honored to have been invited, and I hope that some of my recommendations will be considered. I also hope that discussions such as these will continue so that those of us living in the world of transplantation can help to continually update and improve the procedures and regulations by which transplant candidates live or die. And finally, Thanks. I hope that everyone in this room who is attending this hearing has signed up to be an organ donor and has passed this information on to all of their family and friends and anyone else they know. Thank, thank you, you so much, much Ms. Rubin. Thank you for, and let me thank the entire panel for their expert testimony. And uh, since you have had the last word as part of the panel, I'm gonna let you start off with the questioning. Uh, Ms. Rubin, I understand you moved to uh, 
the Pittsburgh area for a temporary period in order to have your transplant done at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, I'm wondering if you feel having to move uh, Albay temporarily uh, was a, a significant dis disruption to you and your family, uh, family's quality of life. More specifically, do you feel there are enough transplant programs nationwide that are able to serve the uh, population adequately? Well, remember this was 15 years ago, and if I were to need a transplant now, I think I probably would have stayed in Philadelphia, but at the time, Pittsburgh was the best known for treating unknown diseases that required transplant. Um, it was inconvenience, uh, inconvenient for us to move to Pittsburgh. However, my husband's company was very understanding and we did get a lot of help um, from family and friends and people we met out there um, as far as finding a place to live and uh, care for our children. Etc. Now, you know, your, your testimony also brought out the fact of availability. I know a few years back, I read about some programs in uh, s several states that offered prisoners the opportunity to be organ donors. Uh, what are your thoughts about prisoners being allowed to be organ donors? Well, I actually am in favor of it. I'm speaking personally. I don't know that other members of uh, TRIO or other patient advocacy groups would agree, but I'm in favor of it if a, uh, a prisoner wishes to donate. I think that is a wonderful way for them to give back. Um, I think that it will be a hard thing to sell to the general public mm -hmm. and um, I think, um, I think it's going to be hard for some potential recipients, some candidates, to accept an organ from a prisoner <laughs> because there are people who believe that they adopt certain um, physical and mental uh, characteristics from their donor. But you would have accepted. The I would have accepted. I mean, we were getting to the point where uh, Pittsburgh was doing research on pigs, and I we would see. have accepted that too. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the, the next question is for both uh, doctors, Crippen and Callender, and it's, it uh, relates to cost analysis, um, cost of um, keeping a patient on dialysis uh, versus the uh, transplant, the, the transplantation surgery and the cost of that, uh, how those costs weigh out at the uh, at the end, and uh, go ahead, Dr. Crippen, you start. Okay, well, Cal uh, Dr. Callan can start. Oh, okay, well, uh, this was an issue that I looked at uh, because it was clear that uh, dialysis costs about $40,000 uh, per patient per year, and, and many may not realize that the only place in this country where we have universal health is actually in end-stage renal disease. Uh, because we have Medicare and we have Medicaid, and so that well over 90 percent of the patients who have end-stage renal disease actually have health coverage. So therefore, we can get the data, and the data does reflect that it costs about forty thousand dollars per patient per year for dialysis, as contrasted with what you would pay for a transplant, where you may have some costs in the first couple of years, but after the third year, you're talking about break-even. So that's why I made the comment that. Uh, uh, since uh, uh, most transplants would survive uh, based upon our studies of the half-life, most of them would survive for more than six years. Then we're talking about a savings of um, for each donor, increased donor that you get, of maybe $135,000 per donor because of the fact that it's only about $10,000 a year for taking care of a patient for a transplant after the third year, which means that uh, uh, every time you have a donor, you have a positive situation. Uh, when you take somebody off the dialysis list and, and get them transplanted, you've effectively saved taxpayers and the government a significant amount of money. And when we costed it out and looked at it from uh, and, uh, assuming that you, you saved 135000 per per organ and you uh, then had that period of time, then you were able to, and if you talk about just kidneys alone, we, we figured out it was about $236 million. But then if you looked at 
kidneys, if you looked at hearts, if you looked at uh, deceased donors, which provide, for example, two kidneys, uh, live donor one kidney. If you look at a deceased donor and you look at the heart, the liver, uh, the pancreas, the small intestine, and you look at all of that, you can recognize that by transplantation and donation and spending money for donation efforts that you would save the, the taxpayers, the government, uh, millions of dollars just for kidneys alone and then billions of dollars if we talk about uh, deceased donors who uh, gave, let's say, the amount, the 3.5 organs per donor that the, is the goal for the uh, Breakthrough Collaborative. Yeah, and not to sound, sound off with cold, hard stats, so to say, but um, our colleagues would want, would want to know what are the costs and effects of a bill like our Dr. Crippen. Well, I was going to, Mr. Chairman, I was going to give it a slightly different spin, and it gets back to Ms. Rubin's comments about immunosuppression running out after 36 months in uh, patients covered under Medicare. There's a study by uh, Mark Schnitzler, a health economist at St. Louis University, who found that in patients who lost their uh, kidney uh, transplant, the cost of maintaining them on immunosuppression on average was just over $13,000 a year. But to lose that transplant and have to go back on dialysis, the cost of the first year back on dialysis was a staggering $130,000. So by maintaining immunosuppression, again, for the lifetime of the allograft, at least for kidney patients, uh, where you don't have to incur the dialysis expense, it's a huge savings to our country. And is it true that the insurance industry, and I guess our government, uh, has this 36-month uh, month time limit of covering? No, it's, it's not the, in, the private insurers don't operate that way. It, okay. I mean, it's been explained to me that when this program was started years ago, there was only so much money the government could expend towards the cost of immunosuppressive medications. Uh, there have been studies looking at what if we paid for those medicines for the lifetime, and of course it works into the uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and when you talk about the Medicare uh, payment, and initially it was for 36 months, and after 36 months the coverage would end, and I have a number of patients who are now back on dialysis because they couldn't afford to pay anything after the 36 months. So, and that's the time period at which you're breaking even. So it's, it's a disastrous uh, uh, situation where you have uh, mm -hmm. the situation which they both talked about, mm -hmm. where after a period of time, uh, there's no payment for uh, the immunosuppressive medications. And the policy ought to be changed. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Dunn, I'd, I'd like to spend a, a little time on the areas of uh, family notification procedures and presumed uh, consent of donors. What are the procedures for tracking down next of kin in a situation where the uh, potential donor did not indicate whether a gift was intended? And what role does the OPO community play in determining the accuracy and validity of a deceased donor's choice? Uh, thank you. An in-depth question, certainly, with many parts to it. The process that's in place um, based on conditions of participation in the Medicare program is that all hospitals in the country are required to do death notifications when someone is near death or death has occurred. And those phone calls come into the OPO. At that point, in the case of brain death, the OPO sends, physically sends someone to the hospital to um, make a determination on donor suitability from the chart, to huddle with the hospital team, the nurses and physicians, to determine that brain death has actually been declared or is imminent, and then at that point to talk with the family about their options for donation. If the person's on the registry, it's at that point that the, the or we search the registry to see if they're on it. If they're not on the registry, then a skilled team of, of professionals who have been trained in family interactions and uh, bereavement care interact with the, the next of kin that's been identified by the hospital. Most of the time, someone's at the hospital or they're reachable by phone. Um, and that conversation then takes place about that death has occurred, what the options are for donation, um, and how long the process will take. Um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, how the process um, goes. Does that answer? It, it certainly does. I was just uh, just wondering, um, 
what what other steps could be taken to improve to have the to, to improve uh, contact uh, with family? Um, I mean, some sometimes it is probably perceived as pretty cold. You know, it's really a uh, very fine line. I mean, we, shows up. when you know that we really it's crucial that we have a p good partnership mm -hmm. with the hospital staff, the nurses and physicians, because they're the ones that have been with the family from the time of admission through the event um, that's led up to the point of brain death. If we don't have that relationship with them, um, it's difficult for us to have a meaningful conversation with the family about their options. The fine line that we walk is if we're there too early. Quite frankly, the reputation that a lot of OPO <laughs> colleagues have is that we're vultures when, they're, when we're in the intensive care unit. And we don't want to um, create a conflict of interest by being there too prematurely. So it really is a fine line. I think the short answer is that to continue to develop really strong relationships with hospital systems so that we're there appropriately talking with the uh, care providers. And according to your testimony, you do a lot about uh, as far as looking for live donors as well as getting people to declare, I guess, on the back of their driver's licenses. There are, yes, with registry drives, um, that really is with 28 states now having active registries that are registries of consent, um, the, our, all our efforts are to drive people to the registry. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Pruitt, would you uh, please explain for us how you know it's uh, funded by its members and the policy making functions? Uh, it derives through its OPTN charter. How much federal funding does the OPTN receive annually? Thank you. Um, the majority of the UNOS budget uh, in the OPTN budget comes through the registration fees of putting a person who's waiting for transplantation on the waiting list. That constitutes the vast majority of the monies of the $30 million budget that uh, is required to run the allocation system in this country. The amount of money that is um, um, coming through federal funding was capped in the initial NOTA um, authorization back in 1984 at $2 million and has never exceeded that uh, degree of dollars. So that the, the, the burden of the cost of running the OPTN is basically on the, the patients in the centers which goes through. Um, with respect to the um, policy making functions through the uh, charter and through the final rule, uh, there are variety of areas. The first and uh, uh, foremost uh, uh, policy that area that we are supposed to have policy about is equitable organ allocation. Um, the second one is to reduce the risk of transmission of diseases through, uh, uh, through transplantation to potential recipients. We are to address and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the issues of socioeconomic disparities which occur through transplantation and try to minimize those. And then there's some issues relating to policy, and the secretary recently uh, came with the notion that the OPTN should have policy pertaining to the performance of live organ donation in this country. So those are the those are the <laughs> charter areas that we are to address, and the, a variety of functions come up as time goes on, which we also do. But those are the core uh, areas that we are to to address. In in general, what are the uh, demographics of individuals who make organ do donations, both living and anatomical uh, donations? Do they tend to be better better educated or economically advantaged? The the donors or the recipients? Which the, I'm sorry. The donors. The the people who donate um, tend to be. Uh, in a large part, like Mr. Walls, uh, um, educated and motivated to do such. And the people who are disadvantaged in our society who do not feel much of the motivation have a hard time sometimes generating t uh, the goodness of their hearts to think that they need to, gener to donate back to the system. Now, it's not that it doesn't occur, clearly. There are clearly wonderful people throughout the entire system. It's our job as, a, um, as, as an organization and as a, a community of transplantation to embrace the good values of what uh, we as human beings can do for each other to try to make that work. But on and the whole, there are, di there are disparities. And in general, the initial reaction of family members when, the, when, it's, when that option is brought to them, what, is, what have you witnessed? What I have witnessed, and in, in I usually don't witness much of the donation process. We try, obviously, to separate from the transplant surgeon side. But just being a physician in the hospital, 
I've certainly seen plenty of folks die and certainly have seen people who have uh, been requested and that the people who feel like they've been given a short shrift and that they have not been treated fairly um, are oftentimes quite angry at the time of death and oftentimes the concept of donation is just not in their parlance. Well, thank you for that. And Dr. Burnick, finally, is there um, reliable data available on the number of organs that are available to the listed patient population each year but are never transplanted due to the inability of a uh, transplant center to confirm a donor's intent in a timely fashion? I'm not aware of specific data on that score. I think that the uh, implication that one can draw from comments you've already heard that organ donation has clearly been affected in a very positive way by state registries, which facilitate just the concern that you have uh, expressed in that question uh, is an indirect way of uh, indicating that that, that that system could use more um, uh, the facility and, and uh, it shows the benefit of it when, when the registry is in place. <clears throat> let, me, let me ask you, to what extent would increasing our donor pool help close the gap between the number of patients on the waiting list uh, and the number of transplantable organs that are re recovered? And I'm assuming uh, that it will never be a, a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. We um, did 26,000 uh, transplants last year. and. Um, we uh, can show that if we were to achieve the national average of the collaborative goals of 75% conversion rate and rounding off uh, f to four organs per donor, we would move that to uh, just over 35,000. Mm -hmm. And that is our goal now for our collaborative for this coming year. With 97,000 patients on the list, there are patients who are added, there are patients who die waiting, as we've talked about, but we can uh, definitely begin to really turn around deaths on the waiting list. And